This is Chairwoman Tierra Booker Dwyer. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, March 5th, 2024. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Kayla Drummond. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Files Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the March 5th agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any additions or changes to this evening's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials whom it, whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and consult, it, and consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The closed session summary and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D4? So moved from Pong. Do I have a second? Second, Stolaski. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stolaski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank Motion you. carries. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Good evening. Madam Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointment for your approval. Executive Director, School Support and Transformational Leadership, Department of Schools. Do I have a motion to approve personnel matters as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Lichter. Do I have a second? Second from Pong. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stoloski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. We could have the slide, please. Najib Jamal is attending this evening with his wife, Sarah Jamal. If you could please stand so we can recognize both of you. <laughs> Najib is being appointed as the Executive Director of School Support and Transformational Leadership in the Department of Schools. His experiences include instructional coach, 
teacher, resident principal, and principal in Baltimore City Public Schools, executive director at Youth Organizing Urban Re Revitalization Systems, and chief of school improvement and transformation at the Maryland State Department of Education. Congratulations, and welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and Office of School Safety has recommended safety and security protocols which are posted in the board room and available on board docs and on the board's participation by the public website. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of the board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Inappropriate personnel remarks or other behavior such as language that promotes violence against a BCPS employee or that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order and will not be tolerated. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time or prior to that time at the discretion of the board chair. I now call on individual citizens and student group, group as our first speaker. Our first speaker is Ms. Amy Adams from the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. Good evening, thank you. Yes, I'm from the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition, and I'd like to start out by acknowledging the board members who are asking detailed questions related to contract requests. You are being active and responsible board members by providing fiscal oversight. It's noticed and needed during these challenging times. This oversight and accountability is exactly what's expected of you by the public. We want these questions and discussions to occur on the record. We want staff to explain to you exactly how decisions were made before you move forward with these products and services. If you don't fully understand the answers you're given, we expect you to dig in deeper, get the answers, and to have full understanding before voting. Too many times questions are asked in committee and the answer is we will get you that information. But then the public never hears the answer. Do you? As an example, have you gotten all of the SOR-based coursework data for your vote tonight on the higher ed cohorts? If not, we would expect that you wouldn't be voting those contracts through tonight. Along the lines of accountability and follow-up, it's now the first week of March. We have just over three months of school left, and this board has yet to see any true academic data points for this year. Being that a priority of BCPS is improving academic achievement, why haven't you demanded data to prove what's being implemented is having a positive effect on students? How much longer will you wait? The last 10 years of rewarding effort over outcomes has gotten us to our current state. This is our formal request to show the public the data multiple data points of real academic performance data. MAP scores, DIBBLES, AMIRA scores, end of unit test scores, progress monitoring scores, proficiency scores. We wanna see the data proving that the expenditures are resulting in measurable and meaningful gap closing growth for our most vulnerable populations. We are counting on this school board and this superintendent to not tolerate low performing schools and underperforming staff and departments. We are counting on this board not to fear the blowback of upsetting the status quo. We know that a school system cannot intervene their way out of a core problem, which seems to be a current strategy adjust, addressing low proficiency rates in reading and math. But enough time has gone by. Is it working? We've spent millions on curricula. Where are the results? We know effective leadership in education means setting high standards, celebrating successes, and holding underperformers accountable while keeping students' best interests at heart. And we want to see it. We expect the Board of Education to be fiscally responsible when approving multi-million dollar contracts and to follow up with evaluation of the cost-benefit analysis from those contracts prior to extensions, renewals, or replacements. You've tightened the belts on kids and on classrooms. It's time to tighten the belt on ineffectiveness and spending on anything and everything that doesn't change student outcomes. We would like to see the Budget Committee comb through all the active contracts, starting with the ones pertaining to curriculum, examine how much of the spending authority is left, when's up for renewal, and how 
it's an effective. We want to trust all of our board members and school system leadership, but until we see signs of improvement, we're going to keep questioning everything. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Ruben Daniele from Carver Center for Arts and Tech. Okay. So since there are speaker spaces available, we will now call from the wait list for individual citizens and student from the for the individual citizens and students category. The first wait list speaker is Bassi. Yes. Yo. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, my name is Bassia Timidet. I am um, new to the Baltimore County school system area. area. Um, I have come into a neighborhood that has completely turned over from original owners, and now there are new young families in that area. Um, my first comment is about how difficult it was to find information on what was going on here. Um, my neighbors and I are very active members of our community. We care a lot about our school systems. We support option A in the new boundary study um, for the Northwest area. Um, but I had to put out a Google alert. I had to look for this information to come up. Um, and so just as a comment, um, in the future, because I'm sure there will be more boundary studies that are occurring, if there was a way to make finding this information and um, becoming more active in this easier for those of us in the community. Um, additionally, we were troubled by a lot of the information or the comments that we saw from some parents that felt like they weren't hearing about these um, the options that they had until the last minute. And so some parents felt very upset that kids from one school would be coming to their school. Um, and so now we are faced with our kids, if you know option A is adopted, our kids going into a school that isn't welcoming. Um, and it doesn't feel great <laughs> um, to be the new people in the area and going to this great school that we're so excited to be a part of, but not being a part of a welcoming community where they think that we will bring trouble um, and lower test scores. And uh, just so maybe if there was a way to make it so that people could find out earlier about stuff like this, easier to find out earlier. I'm sure you guys are doing the best that you can. Um, but for those of us that are new parents that don't know where to go to find this, that you know just saw a school building being built and started to Google and fall down a rabbit hole and then tell her neighbors, and that's how we are here today. Um, and so we just hope that you take this into consideration um, for future sessions. Thank you, and welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Good evening. If we can put up the first slide, please. This evening, I am pleased to provide an update on some of the very items we were just talking about. We're going to begin with literacy, move through some legislative changes that have an impact on Baltimore County Public Schools, and uh, we will close with information about pre-K expansion and summer programs. Next slide, please. And so I want to begin by thanking our Board of Education for making a sizable in, uh, investment in literacy education for our elementary school students. Um, it is very important that we provide regular updates. And so I'm providing a preview of what we've seen so far with our elementary students. Um, and our literacy team will be back in front of the full board with a full presentation. On this slide, um, we share that professional development is one of our uh, areas where we are making sure that we're investing in the learning of our teachers. We are pleased to report that 110 out of 110 elementary uh, coaching visits with a coach from HMH into reading have been completed. You'll see a quote from one of our principals um, on the slide, these coaching visits not only include uh, principals and members of the leadership team, as well as members of our literacy team from curriculum and instruction, they also include grade level teachers uh, that have an opportunity to meet directly with the uh, coaches focused on literacy. 
Uh, next on the slide, you'll see our data in terms of where we were, how our students performed percentile at the beginning of the year compared to the middle of the year. And so the red bars that you see, uh, if you go back to the last slide, please. The red bars that you see represent our students who performed less than 25 percentile. Yellow is between uh, 25 and 50, light green between 50 and 75, and dark green um, uh, greater than or equal to 75 uh, percentile. What you'll note from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year assessments uh, in the window has completely closed is that the red bar, uh, meaning the students that were performing less than 25 percent, that has uh, decreased significantly uh, for half of a year. And then you'll notice the increases in yellow, light green, and dark green, uh, indicating that our students are increasing their performance with literacy. You'll also note that we shared at the beginning of the year that we had a percentage of schools, I believe it's 17 elementary schools in particular, um, that move forward with dibbles for this year. And so uh, they are in that uh, percentage that did not test. Uh, and so we have some schools that are still uh, moving forward with dibbles for the remainder of this year. And as I shared, this is just high level data in terms of all of our elementary schools that are um, moving forward with AMIRA uh, assessment. However, the literacy team will be here to not only share the high level data, but grade level data, as well as uh, information about our student groups disaggregated. Next slide, please. We are also pleased uh, to share that parents are empowered to find out about how, our stu how their students are doing, their children are doing. There is a parent report that you should have received. Um, Amira currently provides that in English as well as in Spanish um, to uh, meet the needs of our families in those reports. There is a score, a composite score, that shows the student's estimated grade level of reading ability um, compared to where they should be uh, during the year. Then you have the subscores. The subscores um, identify the different strands of, uh, you know, the components that make up, uh, you know, student comprehension. And then at the very bottom of the report, there are specific tips for parents to help student uh, with reading at, uh, at home. And so we ask that if you have not had an opportunity to see that, please reach out to your school uh, to receive your students' AMIRA uh, parent report so that you are uh, kept apprised of their growth since the beginning of the year, as well as uh, different things that you can do at home to help the students to continue to move forward. Next slide, please. This time we're going to switch gears to, uh, as you know, uh, there, we are currently in legislative session in Annapolis. One of the pieces of legislation that affects all school systems uh, is the legislation around virtual education days, uh, starting with school year 24-25. Uh, virtual education days can only be used for severe weather conditions. Uh, there are several uh, components that must uh, come into play. I have also included our board presentation from July 2023. Uh, the results from our community in Baltimore County was similar the previous year. The good news for us is the, are the changes in legislation for the most part 100% align with how we've moved forward with the virtual inclement weather days, meaning that school systems are required to use the traditional days before they can move to virtual days, which has been the will of our school community for the last two years. The only change that will impact us for the following school year, December 20th and May 16th, 2024 and 2025, respectively. Uh, they were listed as asynchronous days for professional learning. They are no longer allowed to be asynchronous days. And so we wanted to point that out uh, to the community. There was an update that was provided in the last board meeting documents um, for Baltimore County Public Schools uh, regarding that specifically. Next slide, please. Again, we want to thank the Board of Education for your support and your uh, vote in favor of the FY25 budget. 
pending county executive and county council approval. We are very excited about pre-kindergarten expansion. The map on the slide shows the different uh, programs that are being expanded across all three zones uh, in our school system. This is based on our data in alignment with Blueprint, really looking at our tier one students who qualify for pre-K um, services on the slide, you'll see the list of additional school sites uh, for the upcoming year. And if you go right to our website, there is information that is already included there about enrolling children. We have some uh, upcoming programs for um, three-year-olds as well as for um, our uh, pre-K students. And we are quite uh, excited about bringing on our younger learners as we know that this has a very significant impact on the uh, trajectory for success for all of our students. Um, you'll find right on the slide, if you go to bcps.org slash parents, you'll go right to the information that you need. And so if you are a new family coming into Baltimore County Public Schools, uh, we are encouraging you uh, to take a look at our website for initial information and for uh, additional specific information, please feel free to reach out to the school. We are very excited about our youngest learners joining us in the fall. Next slide, please. Summer programs. Um, we have announced some of our enrichment summer programs, but wanted to take a few minutes uh, to talk about our summer programs focused on academics. Our summer programs are going to be uh, based on invitation, based on our uh, student data, as we are all focused on making sure that our students have what they need. Overview of the upcoming program. Uh, the dates are on the slide in front of you, July 8th through August 2nd. Important to note, a change from Monday through Friday. Uh, summer programs will be five days per week, four hours per day. Uh, we have programs at the elementary, middle, and high levels coming this summer. Very excited to have 46 regional sites for elementary and our four public separate day school. The content will be in alignment with what we teach during the school year. So HMH for reading, as well as the Bridges curriculum for math. Again, in alignment with the significant investment made by the Board of Education. For middle schools, we will have 20 sites. Uh, we are partnering with the uh, Lavinia Summer Rise Program. Uh, all of the work will be focused on selected grade level literacy and math standards so that we can assess on a regular basis how our students are doing. And for our high schools, we will have both face, uh, face models as well as uh, a flexible uh, blend, blended model. We'll have credit recovery options as well as options for original credit. What's new this year are we, is that we're going to have an evening option at both Woodlawn High School and Overly high school responding to the needs of our students who work full-time during the day during the summer um, we are excited about the possibilities with these uh, these changes to our summer academic programs additional information is forthcoming um, but really looking at the opportunity to have high quality summer learning programs um, that are focused on mathematics reading as well as social emotional learning next slide please And for more information about what I've shared this evening, as well as what we're doing across the system in all different curricular areas, I uh, invite you to participate in BCPS Curriculum Nights. We have two of them forthcoming. First one, March 12th at Woodlawn High School and um, our community conversations. Our community conversations will be an opportunity for us to share uh, the work that we've done to date, uh, what the evidence of that work is focused on our four priorities, but also hear directly from the community in terms of you know, what you're experiencing in schools and what areas uh, you feel we need to continue to uh, focus our attention on. So with that, I thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Any questions from board members? No. Okay, so we will move on. The next item on the agenda is the chair's report. And for that, I call on myself. So members of the Board of Education, we remain active in the community and in schools to, um, to engage with community members, school staff, uh, to inform our board governance decisions.
Since the last chair's report, board members have visited 13 different schools to see teaching and learning in action. And so we are actively in those elementary schools looking at the implementation of, of the curriculum that we've purchased. We're looking at the implementation of those, um, the, the culture and climate and, and all of those resources. So we are actively in the schools. We have met with members of the Baltimore County Education Justice Table to discuss implementation of the Blueprint for Maryland's Future, community schools, and other topics is essential to the school system. We participated in a ribbon cutting of a new state-of-the-art school, Red House Run, that was just absolutely phenomenal, and we're really hopeful that um, elementary schools like Red House Run will become the norm for Baltimore County Public Schools. And most importantly, board members participated in the Parkville High School STEM Fair. Not only did they get a chance to see STEM in action and to review the projects of the students, we, we got to serve as judges and, um, and actually vote on some of those uh, STEM projects by students. So I really do just want to thank the board members for all of their involvement in schools and in the community. It takes a lot of time, a lot of hours that they are committing outside of attendance at these board members at these board meetings um, to really inform our governance decisions. And the next item on the agenda is the student board members report. And for that, I call on Ms. Drummond. Since my last report, I have visited more schools and gotten to meet many more amazing and high achieving students. Students being my top priority, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about a common theme students have complained about, safety. Making our students feel safe and providing them with an environment they are comfortable in is the only way we can begin to really work towards becoming a high achieving school system. As a student myself, I have had situations where instruction was brought to a halt because of safety threats. The first problem with this is it takes time away from, or it takes away from class time. But the second and equally as important problem is that students come to school the next few days on edge and unconfident in their school's ability to keep them safe. But when I say safety, I not only mean safe physically, but safe mentally as well. Every school I've visited in the past couple of weeks, I've started with questions alluding to if they f feel they have someone in their school they can comfortably confide in, whether that be academically or personally. Many students say yes, but there are too many students that say no that I can be comfortable with. Students having teachers that really try to relate to them and on a personal level and push them to thrive give them more confidence in class and that teacher. This allows students to ask more questions and stay engaged in the class. Most, most importantly, students know that they have a staff member in the school that truly cares about them and will listen to them if they need to talk. At least one trusted adult in the school build, building can be extremely helpful with every aspect of a student's life. I could continue to talk about this topic for hours, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Drummond. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, Northwest Area Elementary School Boundary Recommendation. And for that, I call on Dr. Grimm. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pupfrey, Superintendent, <clears throat> excuse me, Superintendent Dr. Rogers and members of the board. We are here this evening to request board approval of the recommendation of the Northwest Area Elementary School Boundary Study Number One Committee. As a reminder, the purpose for this first boundary study was to provide capacity relief to Northwest Elementary Schools, return students to their home schools from Campfield Early Learning Center, eliminate satellite boundaries, and to improve efficiencies. At its meeting on February 13th, 2024, the board received for consideration a recommendation for option A from the Northwest Area Elementary Boundary School Study Number One Committee. This option received 94% approval by the committee members for this particular study. A public hearing was then held on the recommended boundary changes on February 21st, 2024, for additional comment and feedback to the board regarding this process. At this time, we're requesting the board's approval of option A from the Northwest Area Elementary School Boundary Study Number One Committee. May I have a motion to approve the Northwest Area Elementary School Boundary Recommendation as presented as option A in Exhibit J1? So moved from Paul. Is there a second? Second, Young. Any discussion? Ms. Lichter. 
Um, I just want to thank the members of the Northwest Boundary Committee for the work they did on creating the new boundary. It's commendable that the committee was able to work together to create boundaries that met the purposes outlined, provide capacity relief to the Northwest Elementary Schools, to return students to their home schools, to eliminate the satellite boundaries, and to improve efficiencies. The 94% agreement on the proposed option is also impressive. I also want to thank and acknowledge the members of the Northwest Committee that attended and spoke at the board hearing on Feb February 21st. Following the hearing, I continued my research based on the comments about the Gwenville community and how they affect capacity at Bedford Elementary School. I understand the concerns about having schools open at capacity. Recommended option A will have Bedford at an estimated 88% capacity or 605 students. State rated capacity for Bedford Elementary is indicated at 689 students. Option C that was also mentioned at the hearing would result in 87% capacity or 601 students, a difference of only four students between the two options. Also, while we don't want schools to function over capacity, any student that resides within the new boundary will be provided access to Bedford Elementary School. I understand that there's a concern about the number of students residing in the Gwenville community, which was not accurately included in the data the committee used. However, the Boundary Study Committee was provided information sourced from Baltimore County Public Schools, Baltimore County planning and state agencies, and this process follows best practices for predicting school enrollment and utilization trends. So again, thank you um, for those who came to the hearing, provided us with more questions, um, and I just wanted to clarify a little bit about the option A and option C and where the numbers came from for that Gwenville community, um, so thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Delusky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Grimm. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Burns. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Rogers, members of the board. Uh, in recent closed session, the board considered and acted upon appeal, appeal case HE24-08, and now would be an appropriate time to affirm your action. May I have a motion to affirm the action taken during closed session on case HE2408, in which oral argument was heard? So moved, Harvey. Is there a second? Second from Paul. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Jalowski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Also in recent closed session, the board considered and acted on appeal case HE 24-09. This would be an appropriate time for you to affirm your action. May I have a motion to affirm the action taken during closed session on case, case HE2409 in which oral argument was heard? So moved from Paul. Is there a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Jalowski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? <clears throat> yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call on Ms. Harvey, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If I may, prior to bringing the contracts uh, to the floor, I would like to ask uh, Superintendent Rogers to speak to questions that were, uh, were unanswered last night at the Building and Contracts Committee meeting, specifically regarding the cohort contracts and the evaluations used uh, to, to vet those particular programs. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, uh, we received the question about evaluation. Uh, BCPS cohort program proposals are determined and evaluated first for their alignment to the four priorities of the school system, and then they're evaluated, they're reviewed by the curriculum, uh, content experts, and the Department of Organizational Development and Leadership. They are focused on recruitment and retention strategies and support, in support of our high need areas, specifically in Baltimore County Public Schools. And lastly, uh, they're vetted to make sure that they're in alignment with the blueprint for Maryland's future. Thank you for providing that additional information. Uh, Madam Chair, members, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board, uh, in addition, to that information, I would like to inform the board that contract L1 for tutoring services for grades four through 12 math, reading, and English language arts were pulled at the request of staff. Tonight, uh, I'd like a motion to approve items L2 through L4 and L7 to L24 uh, for approval. So do I have a motion to approve items L2 through L4? L4. Through L4 and L7 to L24. So moved, Lictor. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? Ms. Dominowski. Could we also pull L9 through L15 to vote on separately? I don't know if I need to make a motion for that or do I? Is you want to amend the motion? I guess, is that, do I have to amend the motion to do that? We Can have I, a mo motion to amend. <laughs> yes. Motion to so amend. we have a motion on the floor that's been seconded. Um, so this is where I'm going to need the next steps. Yeah, sorry. So yes. You're making an amend, you're moving yeah. to amend that motion. Amend that motion. The num but state clearly the numbers of the contracts you do want to bring forward. Okay. So I would amend the motion to bring forward contracts L2 to L4, L8, and then L16 to L22. And L7. 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 Seven. Did I forget seven? Yeah. Seven and eight. Seven and eight. Okay. So L2 to L4, L7, L8. Yes. And then L16 to L24. L24. Is, that needs a second. It, right, is, that a, is there a second? Second, Pumphrey. Any discussion? And so, oh, yep, go ahead, Miss. Uh, Chair Member Dominowski, can you speak to your motion, please? I, I think that while the information that was presented towards us today um, was great, I don't think it fully answered all the questions as far as the evaluation processes that were used to determine these um, higher learning cohorts, as far as you know, aligning with the science of reading, aligning with the SR, there was a, a certain evaluation that was asked about. And I just want to make sure moving forward that we use this practice. Thank you. Uh, and so, uh, Dr. Rogers, dude, could you t speak a little bit about the science of reading and the requirements that programs have to be aligned? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. So some of the uh, cohorts, and I think, matter of fact, many of the cohort programs that we're talking about this evening are not literacy. If I remember correctly, there might be one, maybe two maximum of the cohorts that are literacy that would qualify uh, for the science of reading. Um, but I want to share some information that I did provide uh, the last time we brought some cohorts uh, forward, specifically around the uh, science of reading. Um, and so the first is that there are two programs in the state of Maryland um, that uh, have reported to all school systems that their uh, programs are aligned with the science of reading. Those are Loyola and Morgan um, University. Towson University and the University of Maryland College Park uh, shares that they are in progress in terms of shifting uh, their uh, curriculum content to be in alignment with the science of reading. Um, our state 
uh, interim state superintendent of schools on January 23rd, 2024. She brought forth a board resolution that requires for uh, 2025 and beyond that all uh, institutes of higher education uh, infuse the science of reading in their instruction. Uh, my understanding from uh, watching the uh, tape about the conversation that occurred yesterday um, evening, there was a um, reference to um, a particular group, I believe it's the National Council of Teacher Quality. Um, their assessment was specifically on elementary education reading uh, programs for the state of Maryland. They only deemed one program that was rated at the level A. The uh, board contract, particularly nine, that there was a lot of uh, conversation around, is a special education cohort. So um, I believe it was cited in that meeting that it was rated an F, uh, but that um, actual, uh, if you go to their website and pull up the report for the state of Maryland, you will see that they are only reviewing uh, teacher prep programs uh, for reading in particular, and contract number nine is not a reading program. Um, this is for uh, special education. So uh, number 11 was a for lead, uh, literacy education as well. And I'm just, um, my concern with, as I understand we're moving forward 25, 2025 and above, why are we, why would we want, why, or is there a need to do this right now or to sh do we have to wait, could we wait until we, there is a program that in 2025 that has to have these elements? Is that? A, I understand the question. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I would say that uh, literacy is, you know, it, it's the, um, it, it's pivotal for us to make sure that our teachers are well trained in literacy. One of the things that we shared as a stopgap is that we're making sure by June 30th, 2024, all of our elementary teachers are trained in the science of reading. Um, the state has now moved in terms of what they're requesting all teachers, um, you know, all teacher education programs. Uh, to have, but in the interim, we still need more literacy teachers. We still need more literacy instruction. So I think uh, partnering the work that's happening at the university with those uh, experiences that uh, teachers uh, have, particularly in master programs, uh, with the work that we're doing specifically here uh, with HMH into reading. Um, all of the 110 first visits have already been completed. You know, you can uh, speak to your different schools to find out what those experiences were, what they gained. Along with, we have another 110 visits slated uh, for second semester um, that we are working in earnest to fill in those gaps. And I would say, um, you know, there, there are we have to keep moving forward in terms of literacy. Um, you know, the community has pointed out and we have pointed out, our data calls us to make sure that our students are learning at high levels. And so uh, we have, I, I'm confident that we have uh, measures in place to make sure that our teachers are being well-trained in the science of reading, in addition to the other instruction that they receive at the university as part of a master's program. The only other follow-up I have to that is not to sound like going two steps forward, three steps back, are we going to have, would these programs need to be redone if they are not taught correctly? Like if it, this is not taught correctly, is there any fear that we're going to go back and say these teachers need, actually need to be retrained because this wasn't correct? This wasn't, this wasn't something aligned with the way, with signs of reading, with the the future of the blueprint. So I don't think that's the case because every single one of our elementary teachers are currently implementing HMH into reading, which is based on the science of reading. I've shared with you just a preview of what that data is looking like. It's looking very promising. Dr. Kraft is working to triangulate that data with our MAPR data to make sure that they're all saying the same things. And it's not just that the teachers are going to have blinders on and hear what's happening in that classroom in the university. The university is working as fast as possible to incorporate the science of reading, but they have to also go through the vetting process. But in addition to that, day to day, the work that they're doing with our elementary students is based in the science of reading. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Ms. Frimpong. So I have a question, I guess, about overlap. Um, Dr. Rogers, you had mentioned that in 
the board resolution was made for 2025. And so with some of these contracts, they are going um, into 2025 and beyond. So for the um, resolution, will it be then incorporated into these current, um, I guess, that pathway for them to achieve the certificate? Or do you, do you know whether or not it will be or included or not? Thank you. That I am uh, not sure in terms of what, you know, that final uh, decision is going to be uh, between, you know, the partners, MSDE, as well as the Institutes of Higher Education. I did want to uh, note one of our programs is Stevenson University, and Stevenson University is in alignment with the standards of reading as well, the science of reading, excuse me. You're welcome. Ms. Stileski. Um, thank you. Um, so with Loyola and Morgan already certified or aligned with the science of reading, um, is it a standardized process that then trains the other universities as well? And then is there an evaluation piece built in to ensure that, um, you know, any, um, any aspects of it that aren't leading to positive outcomes are improved? Thank you. Thank you for that question. I'm not exactly sure what their accreditation process is, as it's different than what we, you know, typically would go through here in the uh, K through 12 um, system. I do know that as soon as they make that alignment, they reach out to all their partners and they let us know, um, which is why I made the correction, correction to add Stevenson, because they also reached out to us uh, to let us know that their uh, current curriculum is in alignment with the science of reading. Thank you. And You're then, welcome. is there an evaluation, like a self-evaluation tool built in at all? For the universities? Right, I, and to see the results that are then coming to the county. I am not sure about that. Um, you know, the State Department of Education really uh, regulates what's happening with them. They share with us as partners, um, as curriculum is changing, just like, you know, we would share with things that we receive um, their progress towards making those uh, changes. In terms of whether or not they have a separate evaluation tool, I'm not um, aware of that, but best practice, particularly around accreditation, um, there is usually a self-evaluation tool where you start, you, you know, compare what you have based to the standard, uh, and then there's usually ongoing monitoring, but I don't have specific information in terms of, you know, what their ask has been from the state uh, since this is a fairly new resolution. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Mr. McMillian and then Ms. Lichter. Yeah, Ms. Harvey, when yesterday at the meeting, at the budget contract meeting, if I'm not mistaken, we, as a committee, passed uh, six and seven to move forward to the board. Was there additional information that came out for those to be pulled this evening? Uh, yes, board member from Prong asked that those be pulled, that they be separated for the vote, which we will, after this discussion, okay, thank get you. To that discussion. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Lichter? I just want to make sure I'm clear. So, because there's a lot of cohort ones on here. So the cohort ones that are literacy, those universities or colleges are doing science of reading because a lot of these are math. So Towson has the math, Towson has the science, but the reading ones are from Stevenson and more, mm, Stevenson, anybody can help me. And that's, that's okay. And the, you said Morgan was Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So right now we have, um, we're gonna vote on the amended version of um, the motion, which pulls L2, L4, L7, L8, through L16 and L24. So, yes. So we're voting on if the motion is amended on the amendment. Right. We're voting, we're voting on the amendment, and then we'll do the vote to see if they're pulled. Okay, may I have a roll call vote? Point of clarification, please. Yes, Ms. Frumpong. Did you mention L5? 
wasn't in the primary. Yeah. L2 to L4. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. You're going to say, Ms. Lichter, can you, somebody say what we are voting on this minute? We're we voting. are voting on the amendment that Ms. Dominowski made. Of pulling. To, of pulling. We're just voting on the amendment. We're not actually voting on them. On the, we're not on the mo motion just yet. Just on the amendment um, of L2 to L4, L7, L8 to L16, and L24. No. No? Okay. All right. Say it again for me. <laughs> L2 to L4, L7, L8, L16 to L24. There we go. Did, did you get that, Ms. Lichter? Sure. Uh, um, <laughs> yes. No, we're voting just to say whether we'll pull those separately. We'll be the only ones. We're going to vote. But, on. Okay, so let's, let's, let's clarify again. <laughs> so we are voting to approve the amendment that Ms. Dominowski made to pull L2 to L4. We're not, not, not pulling. pulling. To, to, leave to, we're voting to, to leave them. L2 to L4, L7, L8, L16 to L24. Yes. Ms. Leiter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Delusky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. I'm sorry, Ms. Harvey? <laughs> yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes, Thank motion you. carries. Okay, now we're going to vote on the, well, may I have a motion? We have a motion, okay, so now we vote on the motion as amended. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. So now we will discuss L, L5 and L6. Miss, oh, go ahead, Miss Frempong. Oh, we need a mo. Okay, let so we need a motion to approve L five and L six. So moved, Frempong. Is there a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? Yes. Okay, Miss Frempong. I'm like, there better be a discussion going through all of this. <laughs> 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 So my first question is regarding L5, which is the Destination Management Services. So for, um, and this is for curriculum enhanced student tours. So the question is, is this domestic only? Um, and then what options exist for international travel for our students? Um, so for example, if students are taking a foreign language, um, are they provided with that opportunity to travel to the country with a school trip or via a school trip? Good evening, Ms. Rampong, members of the board, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair and Superintendent Rogers. This particular contract is not for that. This particular contract, um, the vendor awarded is Green Spring Tours. These are for trips to like Philadelphia, Washington DC and Annapolis, a lot of the extensions from our social studies courses. Um, and the reason we have a separate contract is because this company will actually arrange the tour. So not only will they do the transportation, but if schools are going to visit the state house and entrance to a museum, et cetera, they actually plan the whole trip. Um, while there are opportunities that schools pursue around the trips you're describing, it does not fall on this contract. Sure. And then um, for the next one, which was athletic and PE supplies, um, what do those supplies entail? So are these fixed items within the school? Um, and then I guess just as far as looking at spending, do we have warranties or things like that that exist on the equipment? And the other piece would be if there are fixtures, for example, do we have it put into preventative maintenance so we can extend the life of that equipment? <laughs> I can start with the equipment and then Ms. Webster I'm sure is going to answer about warranties and that type of thing. 
Okay, so um, we, first let me offer that this is a shared contract um, through the Office of Athletics. I'm gonna speak to um, physical education. So many of the expenditures on this purchase, um, purchase equipment such as um, tumbling mats. We made a large purchase to replace the tumbling mats in our elementary schools for safety. Um, those are semi-permanent fixtures and that they're often affixed to the wall with Velcro, but they're used in the space. We also used it to purchase our rotating equipment. Um, so that includes things like our table tennis tables, uh, what we call our movement education equipment. So some of you may know that as the Whittle or the Heart Adventure course that you may see set up um, that rotates between schools. So that's not a fixed, um, but that actually rotates between the schools. And then in our high schools, this is often used for weight room. So that is more of like a fixed piece that you described. We do use this not only for um, upgrading materials or new materials, but also some of that maintenance that you described. And then last for, but not least, when we purchase uh, materials for a new school. So right now, supporting Nottingham Middle School with those purchases. Sure. Yeah. Good evening. Um, as it relates to the athletics portion of the contract, the equipment purchase is primarily for our interlastic Inter interscholastic athletic program, but it's also sanctioned by the National Federation of High Schools, um, National Operating Committee on the Standards for Athletic Equipment. These, are, these um, equipment, um, or the equipment provides safety and primary safety items for sports like football in terms of helmets, shoulder pads, knee pads, girdles, lacrosse helmets, chest protectors, arm pads, and it's important for the purchasing of the safety equipment to reduce um, any type of injuries such as con concussions or any other injury risks that would be um, uh, impending for any of our students is to keep them safe. Good evening. In response to the warranty portion of the, your <laughs> question, all of our contracts have t a two-year warranty included in them. Plus, if a manufacturer's warranty is longer than that, we require that they also provide that warranty. Any other questions? Ms. Dulesky. Thank you. Um, just with the $670,000 increase, is that a typical jump in um, spending? And is there anything specific that's unique to this contract that would cost such a large amount of money? Well, Thank you. Sure. I believe Ms. Shea uh, addressed a portion of that when she discussed the wrestling mats, the additional wrestling mats and the weight rooms that had been installed. The other um, impact to the spend authority on the contract is the number of new schools because every time we open a new school, this contract is used to, to provide everything from playground ball, balls and equipment to the actual sports equipment that is used for team play. Thank you. Any other questions? Hey, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Jalewski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item on on the oh wait what oh motion oh okay may I have a motion to um, approve L nine through fifteen where's my vice chair she has it all L nine through fifteen so moved from Paul is there a second second no Any, second is needed no second is needed since it's in. Um, since it's from um, the committee. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Teleski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank Motion you. carries. All right, are we done with that? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Ms. Pumphrey, you missed a lot. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is new business, special project requests, and for that I call on Dr. Jones and Mr. Reed.
Good evening, Board Chair Brooker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Rogers. Um, Mr. Reed is actually here. You can join me, Mr. Reed, um, <laughs> who is the Executive Director of Sparrows Point High School. Um, this is a collaboration between um, Dr. Jess Grimm and his team and the efforts of the Department of Schools. We bring to you the consideration of the privately funded capital project request at Sparrows Point High School um, Beacon of Hope. The 2023 Alumni Association donated the bronze pointer statue Beth, short for Bethlehem, for the installation at Sparrows Point High School. The stand for the statue is made of rails for the Maryland Steel Company, Baltimore County, 1905, prior to the Bethlehem Steel Company. The bricks to be included for the installation are from the administration building dated 1938. So as you can see, this is um, an opportunity for the school to have something of historic origin in place. The Sparrows Point North Point Historical Society encourages efforts to persevere, maintain, and enhance the cultural and historical heritage of Sparrows Point and Southeast Baltimore County. The estimated value of the donated statue, stand, bricks, and lampposts is $35,000. In addition, um, the SPNPHS has an existing grant from the Department of General Services in place to hire a BCPS on-call contractor for installation, and that amount is approximately $43,345. Again, this is a collaboration between the Office of Facilities Construction and Improvement, the Department of Schools, Department of Facilities and Strategic Planning, and so without further ado, we bring to your consideration um, the seven 7330 Sparrows Point High School um, Beacon of Hope um, project. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the 7330 special project request for Sparrows Point High School's Beacon of Hope project? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? Mr. McMillian. I would like to acknowledge Hank Rohde, that's the president of the Sparrows Point Alumni Association in the back. Mr. Rohde and a gentleman named Keith Taylor have spent a lot of time and energy and efforts into these projects. And I want to commend both of those gentlemen, along with a lot of other people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Jalewski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank Motion you. carried. Thank you. And we all look forward to visiting the school's Beacon of Hope, the bronze. So once it's in there, we're, we're coming to it. The next item on the agenda is the report on academic achievement, special education strategic roadmap, and for that I call on Dr. DiDonato and Ms. Myers. Good evening. Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, members of the board, uh, Ms. DiDonato, Dr. DiDonato, and Ms. Myers, Executive Director for Special Education, are here to provide a comprehensive update on our efforts towards uh, moving forward with our strategic roadmap for special education. As you will recall, this summer, we had an opportunity to engage directly with our community members to share with them for feedback and input um, our direction for this current school year, to also hear feedback from them about their experiences in special education. One of the things that we know as a school system is that our data calls us to provide additional attention to meet the needs of our special education students. I want to thank all of you for your support in moving forward our FY25 budget that allows us to address many of the needs of our special education students, particularly our youngest learners with our pre-K programs, our IEP facilitators for elementary schools, and providing special educators across the system, K through 12, to meet the individual and specific needs of our students. We know that our special educators are one of the areas that are highest in need, and they have a tremendous workload. We know as a school system, 
that Baltimore County Public Schools has been working in earnest for many years to address the gaps uh, faced by many of our students. Um, we are uh, very committed to doing this work in partnership with our teachers to reduce the workload in any way possible without shortchanging uh, the very uh, immediate needs uh, that our students present uh, to present uh, to our schools on a regular basis. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Myers and Dr. DiDonato to get into the specifics of what our goals have been and our progress towards those goals this school year. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. I am happy to present along with Ms. Myers, um, really looking at the special education strategic plan and the steps that have been taken and will be taken to achieve the uh, improve the achievement of our students who are accessing special education services. So the graphic on the screen is not a new one, but it is truly our plan of how we are moving fast forward to accelerate the learning for our students. Again, we're focusing on the academic achievement and those intervention supports um, and resources that we are providing uh, to our students receiving special education services. Next slide. Identifying again our key priority areas, Dr. Rogers has uh, repeatedly shared as well as in various other presentations the emphasis on looking at our academic priorities of English language arts, math, ESOL, and special education. Oftentimes we see special education as one of the top priorities, however it also lives very strongly within English language arts and mathematics. We also have students who um, are twice exceptional and they might be English language learners as well as receiving special education services. So when we look at our academic priority areas, special education truly touches every part of our instructional focus. Next slide. Dr. Rogers referenced the work that was previously done, and this information was shared this summer with regards to the strategic roadmap for special education. What you see on this slide is truly the overview that identifies the results, which are the 10-year uh, results slash goals for the strategic roadmap. The three priority areas, people, services, and cultures, identify the three-year uh, indicators and strategies that are going to be used in order to reach those 10-year uh, long-term goals. Next slide. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm excited to be able to talk about, so for uh, FY24, we prioritize strategies. So while this is a three-year plan, we also have to have some um, structure and direction with regards to what we do each year. So as you can see here, this uh, highlights which strategies we are going to focus on, um, and then I'll be able to provide progress on those as we move through this evening. Next slide, please. One of the defining portions of this plan uh, is the focus on performance measures. A lot of our plans in the past have been what we call maybe a, an audit of such related to special education services. But the difference with this is that we identified performance measures that we are holding ourselves uh, to, to be able to report on, which is leading us to this work and this conversation today. So you'll see within there various measures. Um, while it is for 24 to 26, there are some things that we'll be able to report on have already been accomplished, which is fantastic and exciting. Um, also, other areas where we know there continues to be work that needs to be done. So you'll note in there uh, what was kind of a priority for FY24, work that may have needed to happen during the summer, um, or various other things where you'll see um, in the plan. The other thing we want to highlight is there are areas that show 100%. We realize that might be difficult to achieve, but we want to hold ourselves to that um, expectation over time we will get there. The final note that I will make is that you can see on this that under our services, the top there is related to achievement. And at the time, this is a working document on purpose. We want to be able to highlight that that is a, a performance measure that we probably want to raise. Um, at the time, it was listed at 5%. We also reference MAP and um, unit assessment data, but we know that our students uh, could achieve more than 5% for, for a lot of our kiddos. So that's an area that we probably will highlight. Um, we received good advice that we needed a measure to be able to make sure we're holding ourselves to something, but we know we can raise that. So we will get into a little more depth so uh, Ms. Myers can highlight uh, some of the achievements within the priority areas. Again, looking at how are we supporting our people. So those are the teachers, the paraeducators, the additional adult assistants, uh, the 
SLPs and OTs and all of the related service providers who are supporting our students. How are we focused on supporting them so that they can better support our students? So our services, that was really looking at the service delivery model, and as Ms. Myers just mentioned, that's really focusing on what are those supports and services we're providing that lead to increased student achievement, access to instructional programs, and then culture. That's really how our teachers, our staff members feel every day when they're coming to work. So what kind of environment are we creating for them? What kind of environment are we creating for our families when they come to an IEP team meeting? What kind of environment are we creating for our students as we welcome them into our school buildings? And by focusing on our, the people, the services, and the culture, the goal is that we will lead to uh, improved outcomes for our students and families who are receiving special education services. Next slide. So priority one, our people. Um, obviously here, supporting our people and teams to do their best work for students, families, and partners. So we'll be able to get into a lot of the work. Uh, this is prioritizing that importance of all providers and the success of all students and families. We value our teachers. We value our providers. Um, we value um, our schools and the system um, in order to support them and making sure that we have the best things in place for our students to make the progress that we know that they can make. Next slide, please. So three highlighted areas here uh, related to our people. So budget requests, which Dr. Rogers already referenced um, in her opening here, is the exciting area for us was that um, we kind of were dedicated to aligning those budget requests um, for this school year to have um, to special education and increased achievement for our students, and that was done. So positions to support growth, that's something that hasn't happened in recent years for special education, and those were added. Uh, Pre-K expansion and early childhood, which is fantastic, to allowing our students to have access to their home school as much as possible for our youngest learners to be able to be in those home schools and aligning the right supports in order for that to happen effectively for students. Um, and then IEP facilitators, which we know is huge, um, that's one of those that we said was going to be 100% and we hit it right away, which is fantastic. Um, and IEP facilitators just being important for all of the reasons around um, uh, you know, access for, for families, um, good information, um, sharing of information, as well as the compliance end of ensuring that teams are doing what they need to be doing. Um, and the other area that I want to highlight with this is the importance of IEP facilitators and what could be professional learning for schools. So they should be able to be leaders with regards to the implementation of IEPs and what that looks like in a school building. So aligning our, thanks. <laughs> aligning our staffing structure to meet the needs of students and teachers. Um, the importance, um, this was another ad this year, was really being focused on clear um, expectations and how staffing is utilized. In the past, we may have provided special educators uh, maybe inclusion and self-contained teachers, but we weren't explicit with regards to what the expectations are for those roles. And that was a shift, which is an ad, um, fantastic for this school year, where we're able to say, you have this many teachers, this is the expectation for those, and it allows for shared accountability around that. Special education staffing plan is also being updated, or was updated this year. It will also be revised to reflect the additional um, IEP facilitator positions as well as those pre-K um, special educators. Um, but that plan really drives how we're supporting schools, and that is then also being reflected. Uh, and then differentiated professional learning. This is important around that support for new teachers. Uh, I know that Dr. Rogers referenced in her opening that importance of case um, caseload, uh, workload for our special educators, um, for all providers. And the important one of the added you know, layers to that is that new teachers, new special educators, often they're balancing multiple things, like all teachers are, but especially around case management. So that's an area we leaned into as an office this year um, to support new teachers was opportunities for new special educators to get some really closer to small group instruction for themselves with our compliance team, supporting around progress reports, supporting around um, compliance measures, and just ensuring that they have, that was feedback we'd received loud and clear, was that not only are they learning to teach in that first year, but they're also learning all that case management functions we want to just to piggyback on Ms. Myers, part of the differentiated professional learning really does support our long-term goals of um, recruitment and retention for our staff. So for, by providing that differentiated professional development, really trying to meet our educators and support staff where they are, um, that they will feel valued, they'll have the skills to be able to feel successful in the job and the work that they do with students. Next slide. 
The next slide has some important measures here which are exciting around actually that special education teacher retention that I want to highlight. So the first measure there, you'll see that the staffing plan will be updated by end of quarter two. That's an easy win, we call those, right? Yes, it's done. There's a check mark there. Um, we're looking for a 10% increase in average special education teacher retention. The interesting thing about these measures is we looked for baseline. We looked for kind of points where we could give a measure. And then when we were able to gather the data, we realized, wow, 10%, because as you can see there, uh, special ed inclusion teachers and special ed self-contained teachers, that um, average was 89% for special ed inclusion teachers and 88% for self-contained teachers for teacher retention. So that is teachers employed with in one year and then the next year continuing to still be employed in that same role. Um, the other data point that we were able to um, capture, which was very exciting, was that new special education teachers, so those teachers that were hired last last year in our system and continue in the same role this year in our system, we have an 88% retention rate. Um, that's, that's great, right? That speaks to all kind of the things that are happening, the value that we provide in them, um, and just really the work our principals do to ensure that um, folks are valued and supported in their roles. Um, the budget request aligns, another great one we've already referenced. You'll see a check mark there. Uh, the design and employing a staff satisfaction survey where 80% of staff indicate increased job satisfaction. So I can speak to that um, we, we, pr we put that measure out there through um, the feedback for our special education staffing plan. So um, there was feedback that was taken from, uh, we sent out to all stakeholders. Um, we had 812 <coughs> teachers respond. Um, and of that, that is where um, we're able to say that it was deployed and there are some other measures that could be reported around it. We continue wanting to work around um, the focus for making sure that um, our teachers have what they need to do the work, that they have the professional learning so that they feel valued and able to, to do what they need to do. The final note there is, um, as a measure, is that 25% decre decrease in mediation filings. Um, and you can see that we actually met that with a 24% decrease um, in mediation filings from um, there were 58 filings in 22-23 to 44 filings in 23-24. Uh, the note I want to make about mediation filings is you'll see throughout this plan there's various measures that link to each other. What I'd like to highlight on that, um, not only are the compliance aspects of professional learning for teams around the importance of a well-developed IEP and implementation in the classroom, but also around our increased parent advocacy, um, information, reaching out to the community, and ensuring that parents feel valued and informed of the part of the um, team decision-making process. When those things are happening, we see less uh, mediations being filed because the team outcomes are able to be worked at either at the team level or in collaboration with our office. Next slide, please. Priority two, our services. Uh, this really is where we are really focused on expanding um, and refining the services that we're providing to students system-wide. So obviously highlighting um, a focus on special education system-wide as a priority of the superintendent does a lot of um, amazing things for a system. So immediately with that, we've been able to see just that highlighted approach, the, the attention being paid, the um, in data conversations immediately, it's always elevated to have that conversation about our student group, which is great. Um, and, and it's not a bad thing to be one of the um, highlighted areas, right? Because you can have resources for students, things are, um, really supported and, and put in place um, and attention being given um, that has been needed for a long time for our kiddos. Next slide, please. All right, so our service, this is a familiar graphic I think you've seen before. I believe it came from um, the superintendent's um, budget uh, presentation on the top here. But the interesting part that we wanted to highlight here was that it is all combined, right? It's all, it's all connected. The curriculum, professional learning, and PLCs. That's not different for our um, initiatives related to special education. So this year we focused on um, professional learning was an immediate thing that we leaned into. We developed um, professional learning community types um, for job-alike roles for across um, all jobs within our system that where we could do role-alike groups. So those folks meet on six-week cycles um, and really are able to get professional learning that is targeted to their role. So whether that means that you're um, a social emotional learning teacher or you work in one of our um, functional or F FALS or CALS programs. Um, we have running for inclusion teachers, run it for paraeducators, a variety of role-like groups. So we wanted to target professional learning for them. 
Um, we've really focused on uh, increasing fidelity of service delivery model. This is another area, is ensuring that when you uh, cross our, we are a large system, and we have similar models, but depending on where you go, it may look different. So we've really leaned into um, creating look for tools for um, our principals to use, as well as for special educators that are the teachers in the class to know what is that expectation um, and to be able to ensure that there's fidelity across those service models. The other uh, area I want to highlight is the building of capacity for our own team. So that's something that we've also leaned into this year was that, you know, often within the Department of Special Education, you're pulled to um, be that expert with regard to special ed, but we also need to make sure that they have their own professional learning. So some of what we focused on this year was both equity training for our special educators as well as um, ensuring that um, our special educators were doing adult learning um, through uh, our own organizational development, ensuring that when we're providing professional learning that it meets um, the needs of adult learners in order to make, make shifts. Finally, their um, focus on equity and provision of service for each student. This has been a high level of focus for us is ensuring that across our system that we are paying close attention to our trends and data and ensuring that when dis, um, decisions around service delivery are being made for students that we are looking at each student individually. This does come from our equity work. You'll see our measures in there that I'll talk to for a minute in a minute. Um, but just ensuring that um, those decisions are around each student and ensuring that no matter where you live in our system, what your color is, um, whatever is happening, that we're making sure that those services are appropriate. Next, so oh, go. I'm out of order, sorry. Okay, um, so this is an easy, oh, back one slide, please. There we go, okay. So um, this is an easy check with 100% of elementary schools are supported by an IEP facilitator that we talked about that. Um, the next one down is that we're looking for 100% of our special education and general education teachers to report having the resources and support to implement curriculum. This is an area that we know we need to improve upon with regards to professional learning. Um, and, and a lot of that focus is around our general educators feeling empowered to be able to address the needs of all learners in their, in their class. So you see that reporting being at a 58.4% reporting on either having very appropriate or appropriate or somewhat appropriate. But we do want to get that higher and that's our work to be able to do so. Um, the final measure there is exciting related to pre-K um, expansion is that our goal is to have 100% of our three and four year olds who are eligible to have access to that home school. We're moving there. Um, that addition of the pre-K um, special educator to support pre-K and being clear on that um, implementation is um, going to really help us with being able to get get to that space. Next slide. Three more measures to highlight here. Um, the topping that dis decreased the disproportionate placement of black African American students through improved placement practices developed in summer FY24 and rolled out in quarter one. So to address this one directly, um, you will see that we have continued work to address the data trends around both suspension, eligibility, and placement. We as a school system um, have been identified as disproportionate um, around eligibility in particular for um, black African American students who are identified as having an intellectual disability. Um, this is an area that we actually use a portion of our um, special education funding are required by the state to um, interrupt those data trends, address those data trends, and support. At the same time, you can be disproportionate across multiple areas. So it might be we are close to being disproportionate, for example, for white students who um, are, are identified for a speech and language impairment. So it's an interesting um, portion and something that we continue to lean into. Um, we want to prioritize appropriate services and access for each student is something that we are focused clearly on, um, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, another area to highlight is the importance of coordinating with our infants and toddlers providers around um, so appropriate identification for all students. We actually at times can have to be cautious around under-identifying at, at the earliest ages um, and then comparison to over-identification when we're older. So really that balance and continued collaboration to ensure that each student, each child, each baby, right, is receiving the appropriate services and referred across um, across our system. So our services do go birth to 21, which sometimes we, you know, kind of forget that with regards to the birth aspect. But that's an area that also we are really focused on. Um, and then just to hit the measures specifically, we did do focus groups of principals around um, the placement process in our system to ensure for equitable access to special education services, um, as well as um, 
presented that same information to principals and IEP chairs, which was um, noted that we would be doing. Um, and then we have have revised our eligibility tool, um, which is used in the identification of students for special education services um, to align with um, newest recommendations from MSDE related to that identification of an intellectual disability for any to ensure that we are doing it with um, all appropriate measures, um, with a broad base of measures, um, in order to make sure that we're doing that appropriately. Final um, there is that we're looking for increase um, 50% increase of participation for our students to access extracurricular activities. Um, that's a system initiative as well, so we will have baseline data on that to share. Um, and then again, that three and four year old access to home schools. That's funny. Okay, next slide. All right, our culture. Um, Dr. DiDonato talked about this briefly earlier. This is really that um, aspect that I'd like to highlight is the focus on families, community, um, and schools. You turn to the next slide, please. So you can see this triangle, something I talked about over the summer as well, that focus on relationships, collaboration, and communication, and how those things together are able to um, support families, schools, and departments. We want authentic relationships for help to feel like help, for us to be able, and that's not just for schools, but for families, to make sure that there's engagement across um, all areas in order for our families to feel like valued members and informed decision makers at the IEP team table. Next slide. This slide highlights um, what we've done so far around family and community engagement. I really want to highlight this as an exciting time for us around family and community, especially with special education. Some of you may have noticed like an increased presence on social media and different things that are happening. So in half, halfway point of the year, we've had uh, three different podcasts through Parent University related to special education, on uh, special ed process, on dispute resolution. Um, and then just an intro. Uh, we've had virtual workshops uh, for the IEP process and services where we've had a good turnout of families and we're gonna continue to expand those. We've had approximately 30 to 50 participants in those, but we just need to continue to, to gain um, participants. Resource fairs, we've had two um, that are sponsored by the Department of Special Education. One was in the central area at White Oak. The other one was in the southeast area. And then we will also have one um, on, on the west side um, later this school year. Um, and those, again, are focused on we have made broad all resources for families related to um, accessing services for um, their, for their student or child. Uh, county library presence, which is really exciting, uh, two times a month where we're there to be able to engage with families and community members who have questions about how to access services. Again, from that angle of our services going from birth to 21 is a lot of that work is with our youngest, um, our youngest babies in the community and families. Just sharing information about the process for accessing services is important. And then um, Family Support Wednesdays is a, something that our Infants and Toddlers group does um, where they're, it's a support group that runs for, for birth to five, families of um, students who are birth to age five. And it really just a support group for them to have um, access to others of similar circumstance, to have a sense of um, the needs um, and the stresses of having the student um, that is needing something additional at that youngest age. So just support around that. So performance measures here, um, these are some, some easy ones. We did departmental, um, department level training around customer service. That was an area we heard loud and clear that we needed to really be customer service based. So we did that first thing in the summer and that was an easy check. Um, a parent satisfaction survey is something that has gone out that we're asking for feedback on. So that comes at the end of every IEP team. Parents receive a QR code to provide feedback um, with regards to their level of participation and um, the involvement in that school community. Uh, we again want to increase the responses we're getting. We've had, as of when this was um, completed early February, we had 106 responses and that went out in December. So we clearly have more teams than that um, and want to make sure that we're getting more data. But it's a data point that we want our families to feel valued and for us to take that feedback in further um, outreach activities. And then similarly, um, the school satisfaction survey that we had deployed that in December of 24, and that comes out at the end of um, when we are providing a support to a school, when that um, kind of case is closed out in essence, they receive again a survey that allows them to provide feedback on the level of support received. And uh, thank you very much, and we can certainly take questions if you have any. Thank you, Ms. Dr. Savoy. Okay, it has been a historical practice of Baltimore County Public Schools to place African-American uh, males in special education. Mm -hmm. 
based on stereotypes. Is there a criteria in place to prevent this from happening? Yeah, so that is part of why we've really leaned into the placement process to make sure that we have equitable practices in place and to ensure that we're we are making database of decisions. The area that we're leaning into around, um, you know, having very clear and structured things around eligibility, for example, that that drives um, sometimes depending on the identified disability may lead to a certain program maybe being recommended for a student. So, for example, if a student is identified as having an intellectual disability, disability, it may be more likely that they um, over time would have accessed one of our uh, functional programs, for example. So we are um, committed to that eligibility tool is updated for that specific, um, as well as that's why we've been working with schools around what are the data points, what are those things impacting the barriers for them accessing general education, what do we need to do to overcome those barriers, and then really making informed decisions about if we are removing from the general education setting how much, not for all of the day, right? And then, and if we really truly do need along that continuum access to a regional service delivery model, ensuring that that decision is evaluated every year and ensuring that that continues to be the case. We still have work to do in this area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I want to say that it is courageous mm -hmm. to set a 100% goal for yourselves and for our system. It reflects a commitment to our students, to every student, and I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I also want to thank my fellow board members for approving our budget, because that budget uh, allows us to demonstrate and put equity into practice for a traditionally underserved population of students. I cannot uh, express how uh, transformative having IEP facilitators uh, in every elementary school will be for our students and families. And in fact, I'd like you to just briefly speak on what is the difference. I think many of our community members don't uh, understand the difference or know the difference between having a assistant principal or someone else facilitate an IEP versus an IEP uh, facilitator. And uh, lastly, I just want to say I'm looking forward to and appreciate the inclusion of extracurricular activities mm -hmm. for our students who mm -hmm. are receiving special education services uh, because, again, they're often not considered mm -hmm. uh, as, that, as part of their holistic uh, learning experience. Mm -hmm. So thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and start and then let Ms. Myers continue with uh, the importance of the role of the IEP facilitator at the elementary school. So as a former uh, elementary school teacher, assistant principal, and principal. Um, typically at an elementary school, the assistant principal um, wears multiple hats, one being the IEP facilitator or IEP chair. Yeah. So in addition to trying to focus on instruction and often working with transportation and those other things within the building, they really have to have another hat and area of expertise of um, running IEP teams. Oftentimes, they're not certified special educators because proportionally we have more general education teachers than special education teachers, but lots of people go into school leadership. So they're often receiving the very basic training of information about running an IEP team because they might have been a classroom teacher and now they're an assistant principal and that was the role um, at the elementary school level. So this is truly a game changer on multiple levels. One, because you're gonna have people with more expertise, um, better training, who most likely were special educators or were related service providers, um, who have that firsthand knowledge of the development of an IEP, of assessing a student, of talking with a parent about a student's strengths and where we're trying to grow them. Um, so this is really going to provide a, a level of um, expertise of running IEP team meetings. Additionally, it provides that person at the school who can provide training for teachers. So if a teacher is uh, struggling to provide certain accommodations for a student, this person can talk to them about, you know, how do you implement that? And then how do you document that you provided that service or support to students? So this is someone who is going to be there firsthand to really walk teachers and staff through that, as well as someone who's available to families families, that that is their dedicated role, is to really suffer, serve in that capacity um, so that they are available to answer those questions from families, that they can do that follow-up communication with them. Um, so truly, this is a uh, game changer at the elementary schools. Want to add anything, Ms. Myers? 
Yeah, I'll just highlight that we have had the opportunity um, within the last, I guess it was the last year, to have a few IEP facilitators. So the nice part of that almost I'm going to say pilot ask, wasn't a pilot, um, but it was around being able to um, see what works, right? What are the trainings that are needed? Where have they been helpful in schools? What are kind of those data trends? The other thing I really want to highlight is the importance of them being able to implement those procedures, those the eligibility guidance, all of those things that will then help to disrupt some of our trends because they're going to be able to have the professional learning to um, ensure that those team processes are being followed the way they need to be followed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Ms. Domanowski and then Ms. Lichter. Thank you for all that. Um, I don't know if this is part of the presentation, but how many IEP facilitators do we have at the secondary level, or do we have IEP facilitators at the secondary level, uh, middle school, high school? Yeah, so the way the model has run traditionally at the middle and high school level is that we staff based on um, the a ratio for the school for a number of special education students and then we do it to a recommended ratio is what we call that out of that allocation we then um, offer a we recommend to schools to pull a position out to focus on either as a department chair and IEP chair um, or in some schools depending on their numbers we may say you need a department chair and you need an IEP chair um, and then in other schools um, well, that's really it. Is you're either a split role or it's the one the one role that is split between um, two different people. So every school has an IEP chair. We do recommend schools to have backup so that if a um, IEP chair is absent or on leave or whatever other reason that um, we expect, whether that's an assistant principal or someone else in that building, to be able to support. That same model will still continue, that we want to ensure that you know our administrators also have that importance, under, understand the importance of the processes, understand special education in order to be able to help facilitate those teams. So uh, in the secondary level, we're not necessarily dedicating this as a special education teacher position at the IEP facilitator role. Is that what you're saying? No, we actually are. So, are. yeah. So, so it's not just the, the – because you said that it could be um, the assistant principal or the or another chair. No, I'll clarify. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So I use a lot of words. So basically, <laughs> here's the thing. One of the positions out of the overall allocation is dedicated to being an IEP chair. Okay. That comes out of our allocation. <clears throat> That's in every secondary school. We also expect that principals lean in to ensure that they have an administrator in their building who is also trained in the processes of special education in case that person's – that they would then be able to um, run an IEP team. So every secondary school would have an IEP chair. Okay. And then my other question revolves around um, the inclusion of the most inclusive environment for IEP students and for special education students. Are we ensuring that the most inclusive is the most safe for these students as well? Like, are we putting all the, I, I know we've had some speakers come in and say that uh, you know, there's some of their IEP students or special education students, when they're put in the inclusive environment, it's not necessarily ready for the safety precautions that this particular student needs. Is, are we, uh, what are we doing to ensure that this doesn't happen? So, um, <laughs> there's a lot of, a lot a lot of layers of to that question, <laughs> yes. So we are legally obligated to provide our students access to the general education setting to the greatest extent possible. We are legally obligated to that under IDEA. So if a student is identified as a student receiving special education services, they are, um, they are protected in order to have access to the general education setting to the greatest extent possible. It is an IEP team decision as far as what services and supports are outlined on the IEP. Um, within that IEP development, you look at a myriad of things, but the goal being that students have access to the general education setting as much as possible. There are circumstances where that's why there's a continuum. So I know we've talked about that in past meetings around the continuum of services from LREA to the most um, inclusive to um, we have students in private separate day schools. Home and hospitals more restrictive because we know they're at home. So along that continuum, that's part of what that decision making is, is what are those services and supports a student needs in order to access? And if they are at to such level that they can't access for whatever reason, then they might access more of a self-contained setting. We have behavior plans for students. We do functional behavior assessments to ensure that we are addressing the function of a behavior, putting reinforcement systems in place to make sure that our students are learning um, replacement behavior, targeted appropriate behavior. Those are all of those things that are in place to be able to support our students. 
But ultimately, I do want to highlight that we are legally obligated to provide our students access. We are also obligated to provide those supports um, in order for that to be a safe environment for all students. Right. So just, I mean, this is not like a criticism or anything. I'm just, I'm trying to, like, how do, how do we, how are we like bringing that data together that bring, giving them the most inclusive environment um, legally plus like, you know, are they, are they excelling in that most inclusive environment? Is that the best place for them to learn and for all students around? Is it the best environment for everyone? Are we make like, so I think, you know, what that really comes down to, though, is an IP team decision. So it's not a decision Ms. Myers makes. Right. It's not a decision that I make. So it, it truly is that, you know, the IEP team and the parent being a part of it, as well as the, the student at some ages might be part of that team meeting, as well as all the service providers that, that work with that student, including a general educator if, and all the related service providers. And truly, it's a matter of looking at all the data and, and identifying um, those supports that they need to be successful. So it's, it is an IEP team decision. So I, you know, I think the biggest sort of takeaway would be that if parents have concerns about the supports that their students are receiving, their first call should be to their student's teacher or to their special educator and case manager about um, the supports that they're having and that if an IEP team meeting is needed to, to examine that. What are the number of days that a student might be successful versus the days that they're struggling? Or are they still making academic progress in a less restrictive environment as opposed to maybe when they were in a more restrictive setting? So it's truly the IEP team that drives that. So just to bring it full circle to Robin's point, having this identified IEP cheerleader in the elementary level is crucial. And thank you for doing that. Thank you, Ms. Dominowski. Any other questions? Ms. Lichter, yes. Um, and also to Ms. Dominowski's point, sometimes it's the professional learning that you talked about before. So while our special educators need a lot of professional learning, our general education do, and also the schedule that that principal makes for that building is huge. Sometimes we think about including kids in art and music and gym um, who have special needs, and then the behaviors come because those are the, the least structured um, places for them. So sometimes we are putting barriers or putting um, kids in places that without the support that they, they truly need. My question was about workload. You had talked about um, trying to reduce the workload of special educators. I was a special education teacher, so back then my it was a huge workload. Are there patterns and trends that you're finding when you talk to teachers about what, what do they mean by that workload? Is it case management, too many kids, or the complexity of the kids, or trying to get to too many classrooms? What, what are they saying as far as the workload piece? So there's a couple of layers. We actually work very collaboratively with our um, TABCO group called SWAG, which is our special ed um, work group that's, that really focuses on one of, that's one of their main topics for us. Um, and most recently, we've been having conversations around, yes, there is, a, there is sometimes the feeling of um, the balance, the challenge of balancing between both um, classroom implementation of IEPs and service delivery and the case management. Um, also, we do work really closely with also our um, Office of Staff Relations to ensure that we um, are providing a, a pro there's appropriate planning time in place for our special educators to highlight, which is really a great thing, is that our special educators actually receive more planning time than any other special educator in the state, which is fantastic. Where we can lean in around workload is ensuring that that time is efficiently spent for them so that they're not having to go around looking for um, documents that they might need for a team, that we have conversations with principals around uh, special education management plans and buildings to ensure that there's kind of shared accountability of ensuring that folks have that. The other, uh, some of the other things that we're, we're looking at and have been able to support is some electronic options for things like acknowledgement forms for kids so that when we know that it's required that um, all, any provider for a student has an understanding of um, the IEP, there are ways to do that that are more efficient um, that would allow for special educators to not have to go around and try to get signatures from people but to have kind of like more of a uniform way of doing that. So those are just some, some various things that we're leaning on currently. Um, we also heard um, that was one of the, the measures that we, we look for in our data was around that balance. And about 50% of our folks said that they didn't really feel bad. What I'll highlight, and as, a, as something that is exciting, is that that retention rate, when you look at special educators for both self-contained and inclusion, so that's folks that have been in the role, um, tenured or not for periods of time, the one year to the other was in the 80% and high 80s. And then for our first years, still is at the 88%. So while there is work to do with workload and we're gonna to continue to collaborate and do that, 
I am um, excited to see that something is working um, and that our teachers are feeling valued and able to, to stay with us. But we want to ensure that we retain them beyond that year, obviously. So we'll continue to do that. And my last comment, I just want to thank you that the presentation has, has so many data points in it. So whether it was 5% or 100%, just having that many data points gives us a, a, a better pulse on where things are and also the honesty about the disproportionality. That is a huge issue. It's been a huge issue. It continues. But I appreciate you, you know, including that in this presentation and talking about um, the, the work that needs to still happen. So thank you. For the opportunity. Yep. Any other questions? Dr. Uh, Savoy and then Ms. Pumphrey. I, I didn't get a chance to say it before, but it was a very brilliant presentation. And I thank you for your feedback. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just a quick comment, and I'm reiterating again what some other board members said. Um, I, we often hear negative comments about our um, special education services, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that you presented us with data that showed the goals that we're meeting and the progress what, that we're making, as well as showing specific data points that point to um, goals that are unmet um, and what we're doing to work towards meeting those goals. So thank you for the very detailed presentation. Mm -hmm. Ms. Rampong? Um, this was a great presentation that there was so much information provided and it was honest, right? You talked about the things that are working well and then you also talked about the things that we still have some work to do. Um, so one of the things you mentioned, you said that the special educators have more planning time than any others mm -hmm. in the state. Is that specific to the special education teacher or what about if there's a general ed teacher who has special education children receiving services in his or her classroom? So it's special educators, um, and the reason for that is special educators, the unique aspect is that they are responsible for case management for the students. So writing IEPs, doing assessments, progress reports, um, a myriad of other important paperwork type activities, not just paperwork, clearly there's a lot of meaning and you know importance behind this, but just to kind of highlight that. In addition to, they are also the service provider for students. So they're also, whether they're doing small group inside gen ed, whether they're co-teaching, whether that we have special educators who are the teacher of record, um, maybe for multiple classes. So on top of it, they are, they are sing planning, um, on their own, not co-teaching, right? Um, and as the service provider, so then taking data, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, we acknowledge that it truly is um, a heavy load for special educators. I was one. Um, I do. I love it. You can tell that, right? Um, but at the same time, um, we, you know, we need to support in that in order for them to feel like they have what they need. So not that it's too much, right? We acknowledge that this is something that has been um, a focus um, in order for them to have that appropriate time. But general educators. Yes, they need planning time. It, it, it is a little bit different. They have, they have different focus areas. Thank you. And I do have another question. Mm -hmm. um, for the priority three with the culture, mm -hmm. um, I was glad to see the incorporation of a parent survey um, so that you know parents are an important piece of that IEP team mm -hmm. um, and really feeling like they have voice and choice in what happens to their student, mm -hmm. their children. Um, so it that was 106 responses. So what is the... I guess, percent response rate, because I saw what the goals were, but then the response rate was just 106, per, 106 responses. What is that as far as a percentage? Honestly, that's an area that we need to lean into further. We were able to just say this is how many, but we need to calculate it against the number of teams had. Um, so while we do it at the end of every team, the conversation also is, should it be at the end of every single team? Should it be a certain types of teams? Um, because parents may come to team for a, a variety of reasons. Um, so that's something that we're looking into. Um, but so we do have, you know, what's gone on within the responses, making sure that our goal is getting that information. Are they feeling a valued member? Do they feel that they have the information they need? Um, we also around the, the school, do they feel like a valued member of the school community? Because we do know that some of our, a lot of our families are going to school outside of their home school. So because in order to access those services in a regional program, they don't have access to their home school. So how is that? Do they feel that they're still part of the community in access, or are they feeling kind of like othered in that? And that's something we really want to lean into to make sure that um, our families feel like they're empowered in their decision making and part of the community. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a few questions. So uh, Dr. D. Denino and Ms. Myers, thank you for this presentation. I think this just emphasizes the, the direction that Baltimore County Public Schools is going in. And it really should be a call to 
all special education teachers to submit their applications to work for Baltimore County Public Schools. You get more planning time. We already have the top tier pay. So um, I definitely think um, special education teachers should want to come and work here. And, um, and just on that point, so on slide 13, you have um, you put in there that 58.4% reported having very appropriate, appropriate or somewhat appropriate level of resources and support from the department. Um, and that is a big range, very appro appropriate to, all, to somewhat appropriate. So what is it that, um, that teachers are reporting? What is it that they need more of? What are those resources? Um, was that a follow-up in the survey to, for them to, to talk a little bit more about what resources are needed? No. <laughs> no, I, uh, go ahead. Ms. Myers, um, no is the correct answer, but we could Again, probably right. guess um, and be about 99% correct that they want more time, that they need more time. When you talk about co the competing interests and just the load, um, I think most of our special educators from pre-K all the way to 12th grade will say um, time, even though they have you know the largest uh, amount of planning that we've also been able to, uh, throughout the calendar this year, provide some dedicated time for um, our special educators. But we know that the needs are also growing and so that they're in there with a very important job, uh, but many times a difficult job. And so there's, they need more time. And that is something, so that, that's um, good to know. And that is something, I think surveys are great. They're a good first level cut of data, but doing some focus groups with teachers, with parents to really get deeper into um, some of their survey responses. And, and I'll just say that when, this was a first kind of avenue, right, of saying where can we even get some of these data points? So we use the staffing plan survey as a feedback point. Um, we also have used opportunities with QR codes and things. We actually are measured on our parent um, survey performance through MSCE, um, which I'm sure you know, and we traditionally have a low rate. So that's part of our parent community engagement aspect is working with communications, which has been great, and other areas to be able to get that, and then to be able to have the underlying questions asked. So 100% hear you. Yeah, I just, you know, that's something that we need to continue to work through. And then, um, and then moving forward, our students with IEPs, you know, we know that there's this big push for college and career readiness, and I know that um, some of our students with IEPs are not necessarily on the diploma track. Mm -hmm. So how are we ensuring that these students are able to transition mm -hmm. after they're finished with their K-12 um, time to, to have a job and to be productive members of our society? So could you talk a little bit about like just that the transition and how that support is being provided to, to our students. Yes, and I'll highlight that one of our measures actually we shifted to include college, career, and community ready just for that reason. Um, and that 18, our 18 to 21 group, which is what you're talking about, right, is that um, is an area that we are looking to build. Um, that is an area of focus that we need to continue to grow. Um, we do have transition facilitators. We have a couple of job coaches that can support in that realm. Um, but that's an area that we continue to lean into as far as um, where we can expand. We have a couple of schools that we've been able to do some um, initial programming with regards to uh, work-based learning within the schoolhouse um, and utilizing our schoolhouses first in order, there's a, we say it's an infrastructure in itself of job opportunities, right? So how can we start to um, provide some of those? And then also using kind of infrastructure within the system for other opportunities for our um, students to be able to access. So it's an area that we need to grow. It's 100% the case, um, and we are committed to doing that uh, because you're right, we, we have to be able to hit, you know, kind of all aspects of the spectrum. And I'll stop there, but this is, this is really good and encouraging. Any other final questions or comments? Well, thank you all. This was truly phenomenal. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is board member comments and agenda setting. I'll start with Mr. Young. I just want to thank the staff for doing all the research to answer our questions and have a good evening. Ms. Dominowski? No. Ms. Hint, no. Ms. Frimpong. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think with our uh, boundary studies that we've been doing a better job of trying to engage all of the different communities um, that are affected. Um, however, I would say that hearing still some with public comment and even at the uh, from the public hearing about people not being aware of what's going on with the schools, whether it's because they're elderly and they're not as tech savvy or, you know, they're not yet in the school, but they are in the neighborhood and they'll be affected. Um, just looking at some ways to still continue that outreach to the community that's impacted. Um, but I think we're making some some good strides. Um, and that's it. Okay. Ms. Lichter? No comments, but thanks. Okay. Ms. Pumphrey? I hope it's okay. I would like to make a couple quick comments about some schools I visited this week. Yes. Or in the past two weeks. Um, at Catonsville, um, Principal Ames uh, mentioned their increase of ESOL students and how they are implementing student ambassadors to make the students feel welcomed as they come into this, to the new school. Um, at Stricker, Principal Kearns, um, I heard some feedback that she's doing an amazing job with the climate and culture of the school and improving um, behavior with initiatives such, such, such as school dances, which in the past have she's not been able they have not been able to do at that school. Um, at, Mil at Milford Mill, Ms. Shipman um, uh, hosted me, and I saw some initiatives to improve their achievement in mathematics, which was is led, of course, by their math chair, Ms. Blackwell. Um, at Charlesmont, their assistant principal um, hosted me, Ms. Davis, and I um, observed some ELA and math classes. And Ms. Davis is also a, reading, a former reading specialist, and she mentioned how um, the new curriculum, the teachers are really starting to see improvement in students and really, um, um, you know, uh, uh, improving their, uh, their professional development is helping them to understand that the HMH program is actually working for their students, which was very nice to hear. Um, Ms. Davis at Sandy Plains um, showed me their food pantry and also um, the items that are provided to the students. They're, they've been a community school for a few years, and the, their facilitator is amazing. Um, and I actually observed a student in their kindergarten class who used some resources on the wall to um, make out some words from, um, from their math that they were learning. She um, was sounding out the words using some resources in the classroom, which I thought was amazing. Um, and finally, Mr. Hobbs at Patapsco um, led me around to see some of the magnet programs. Um, and I spoke to a student who expressed um, that she feels that the safety issues are addressed immediately when, they ex when students expressed concerns about safety in the building, which I thought was um, a nice thing to hear in that school. So thank you. Thanks. Ms. Drummond? No comment. Okay. Ms. Daleski? Um, I just want to thank the special education team for the strategic roadmap. Um, it was really transparent um, with detailed data, completely honest, and um, really sets the tone for um, where our school system is heading. And also, it was just really informative for members of the community that might not understand how special education works. So thank you very much. Dr. Savoy? Yes, I thoroughly enjoyed the presentations tonight. And also, I'd like to say we went out to Franklin Senior High School, and we got um, it was Ms. Zaluski and myself, and instead of seeing students working, we were sidetracked, and so we have to go back. We saw everything in the school except students working in the classroom. We walked all over the school. We saw the auditorium. We saw where trees fell, everything you could possibly see, but we didn't get to see the children working. My fault for not paying attention, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but one of the amazing things at Franklin is all of the newly enrolled ESOL students are paired up with a mentor, and not just for a day or two, but it's a like a short-term plan to um, immerse the newly enrolled student, which just seems like a really positive thing. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Mr. McMillian. Uh, an agenda item that I'd like to see board leadership and uh, Dr. Rogers think about is uh, an update on our alternative education programs. Yesterday during contracts, we talked about uh, the contract for Meadowood and also Rosedale came up. We talked about the square footage. There was a brief conversation about the number of students that are attending these programs. Uh, 
and I know that there's been changes in the programs. For example, Crossroads, at one time, the family and, and including the student, made a commitment to stay at that school for one year. That's no longer happening, from what I understand. Uh, so it's revolving sort of like the other schools, uh, alternative schools. So I'd, I'd really, I think that we could benefit as a board. I think the public could benefit and, and see exactly what's going on right now with those alternative programs. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Harvey? I have nothing at this time. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes, um, this kind of goes along with what Ms. Drummond said in her um, student address today, um, student board member address. I'd like to, and I've talked to Mrs. Dr. Rogers about this as well, I'd like to see um, in, a, in a short, in a coming agenda item to talk about um, making our schools a safe place for all of our, each of our students and what we're doing behind the scenes. I know we don't talk about that, but I know there's a lot of conversations going on and I'd like to hear from committee members and from board members about um, what we're doing to hear from our students and make the, you know, make our schools a place that is isolated from the rest of their environment. They walk in those doors and they're here to learn and they're here to be safe. And I just want to, I think there's a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes that we need to we address and talk about and and work on together thank you miss dominowski and um and just in speaking on that i, I will um, close us out with this so one of the comments i would like to make is that i am often principals may see me and at the after school activities that the schools are having especially sports because safety is something i am concerned about um and what well, I was concerned about it, but what I see now more and more as I go to these after school activities, you see a strong presence of uh, police officers. You see, especially at the secondary schools, you see SROs, you see mitigation strategies, whether it's how people are entering the buildings, there's certain um, strategies that principals are using so that um, these large events are, are you feel very safe at them and I you know I don't know the numbers we haven't dug deep into the um, number of incidents or anything like that but I can just I know just from um, being actively involved in a lot of the after school things in Baltimore County over the years I see a definite difference this school year compared to others um, especially regarding safety culture and climate so I'm just letting principals know if you see me pop up at a lacrosse game or at a you know I did pay for the ticket I um I go to ticket spigot or hometown I'll get a ticket and um and I will go and see because I know that there's a lot that happens after school they are important and I definitely for all the schools that I've been to the high school and middle school principals are just doing a phenomenal job at ensuring that those events are safe our students are safe and that our families are um, enjoying the games so for that I just I can see what we've put in place in motion the budgets that we've approved and, and some of the things that we have adopted so um so I definitely Definitely thank Dr. Rogers for that um, because I do see that difference after school. So the last item on the agenda is announcements. As a reminder, the board will hold a public hearing on the Central Area Elementary School Capacity Relief Boundary Recommendation at Lock Raven High School in the auditorium tomorrow, March 6, 2020. Um, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. Speaker sign up begins in person at 5.30 p.m. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 19, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Hmm. You know what? I'm